in the global spotlight and good for singaporeans to go to birmingham rather than just london and yeah. oxford and get yeah. out to birmingham see a different city awesome let's move on to our guest this hour the uh, the welfare of animals is what we're going to talk about next and acres which is a local organization that tackles the wildlife trade that that rescues and rehabilitates uh, animals that are injured here in Singapore, uh, educates us humans about the, the need to take care of our animals, all very important uh, parts of the mission of Acres. They are now reopened after two years of being, and five months of being closed. Joining us now is Kalai Vanan Balakrishnan, the CEO of Acres. So great to have you with us in the studio. So great that Acres is open for business again. How are you doing? I'm good. Good morning, Neil and Glenn. Uh, great to be here. <laughs> I think the previous interviews were all done through uh, online, so it's great yes. to be in the studio with you folks. Um, yeah, we are doing good. Well, technically, we never closed our rescue operations and all this was still running. Uh, but now that you know the COVID measures have lightened up, uh, we can finally get more volunteers, uh, more visitors down to Acres, yeah. where we can do more of our advocacy work. Uh, we can reach out to more people to show to show them what we're planning to do for the rest of the year or in the future to come. Yeah, Beautiful. what do they do when they when they come down to Acres? What do they actually see? What can they do? Um, so obviously, I mean, we have a lot of animals uh, from the exotic trade that we have a sanctuary for them, and uh, we always welcome visitors uh, not to just come and see the animal, but more importantly, learn about why these animals are at Acres in the first place. Uh, because if given a choice, we don't want them here either, but they are yeah. here because there's nowhere else for them to come. They have been smuggled over, um, so they can come to learn about why these animals shouldn't be bought uh, from the black market and kept as pets. But other than that, you know, we can echo more about our other work about animal welfare and all the native wildlife rescue that we do, the crime work that we do. Um, hopefully, we can start doing roadshows and campaigns in the near future as well. Yeah. Well, we'll get nice. to the details of your event, which is next Saturday uh, shortly. But in the meantime, how has it had an impact on you? Why do you think it's so important for members of the public to have that interaction, to have that engagement, to get down to your... I've been there several times your wonderful rehabilitation center. Why is it important for members of the public to engage with what you do? Um, I think it's important because I think a lot of Singaporeans or a lot of people in Singapore still don't know about the work that Acres does. On top mm. of that, there's still a, a, a lack in awareness about what to do when wild animals are sighted mm. uh, in public, whether it's otters or macaques or whether it's snakes, any animal, people still lack the awareness. And uh, whether it's, you're talking about compassion or what to do and what not to do, um, we are here to raise that knowledge to the general mass. And, you know, it's very important now, uh, more than ever, you know, as we urbanize more, obviously more animals are being sighted. Uh, mm. The COVID has had a big impact where more and more people got to know about the animals here and, and all the various issues. So many Facebook groups popped yeah. up about animals as well. We, so more and more people are knowledgeable, but they might not know what to do. Just yeah. to add that, well, maybe give us some of that awareness because I've heard some of the so many funny stories over the years, with phone calls you've had, I don't know, where, <laughs> I've got cockroaches in my apartment or something. I mean, what are some of the funnier phone calls or things you've had and what, and maybe you can just clarify what it is you do and don't do? Um. Okay, so we have had gotten calls about a bee a single bee. A single bee. A single bee flying. <laughs> I rest my case. Um, people. We do don't... not call Acres with this complaint about a single bee, even if it's a big one. And the call was actually a referral by the police, so they actually had initially called police. Oh, wow. Come on. Yeah. Either way, I mean, Acres doesn't handle bees, um, but, you know, it's just that the fear, they want to see a single bee, for example. And, and, and that is just something, even though we don't handle bees, uh, we refer these callers to people who humanely or ethically relocate bees. You know, mm, gone wow. are the days where, you know, when you see a bee, you just burn it down. Uh, bees are so important and vital to the ecosystem that now more and more people are adopting a more humane approach. So cases like that, then, of course, every day we get calls about snakes that were sighted a week ago. Can you come and look for it? Yeah. Uh, or people are fearful of birds. So there's a lot of funny calls, you know, weird requests. Um, I mean, we get calls about otters very often, like a single otter running 
and people are confused authors should be in groups there's a single author something has to be done so that's when we we tell them that look there are even though they are social animals there are many incidences where there are single authors roaming everybody around. needs a little space yeah uh, they, they can be left alone yeah <laughs> i mean i know you've got to be diplomatic but sometimes you must wonder that people have too much time on their hands i mean if they're calling up about a single bee a snake that they saw a week ago a lone otter minding its business. I mean, your, your phone, your, your hotline must be off the hook. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, during COVID, our call exceeded 2,000 calls a month. Wow. Yeah, especially when COVID first hit, the, hit, hit us bad. And um, what's the, what would the normal be? during non-COVID times? A non, just before COVID, we were hitting about 1,000, 6,000, 7. Right. Then it exceeded 2,000. And this is because more thousand. people are outdoors in the more park. More people. Connectors. And yeah. you're getting an influx of calls about bats. I will never forget that one or two weeks, it was just non-stop about bats. Everybody <laughs> started looking out for bats in the trees <laughs> and started calling us because of the links to COVID. And we had to tell them that, oh, oh, look. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, Just yeah. don't eat them and you'll be fine. Jeez. <laughs> oh, uh, we've had talking... bats here for hundreds of years yes. and now it's a panic. Uh, we're talking with Kala Avanam Balakrishnan, the CEO of Acres. And if you're not familiar with Acres, uh, you can uh, go to acres.org.sg. Uh, they tackle the wildlife trade. They rescue animals around Singapore that may need some rehabilitation or who are just in the wrong place as it relates to humans. And they, of course, give us a lot of education um, as well. And uh, when you when you think back to the uh, to the pandemic, uh, Kalai, you know, we we noticed something in in our house, which was all of the wildlife came back, especially yeah. when we were in the in the um, in the circuit breaker, right, and yeah. the lockdown. Fewer cars, fewer people outside. Butterflies came back. Yeah. Um, we actually we live near the Astana. We had monkeys in the in the mango trees near us that we never ever have because yeah. they were you know freely moving backward and forward. We would we refer to it as the return of the meadowlands. Exactly. It, uh, at East Coast Park, for example, and all of the other parks, right? They were not trimmed. They were not yes. cut. And it looked and great. So the, it the looked grass great. grew and the and the wildlife came back. And you know when you think back to those and 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 with a little bit of a change in mindset. Singapore could repopulate itself with animals again in, in a positive way, right? That would help our ecosystem, that would help our environment. Is that something that you that you think about when having been through the circuit breaker and COVID or, or are we at the right place with how we're managing our built up life and our animal life? Um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, during the circuit breaker, I remember how the plants grew, suddenly butterflies came back because of all the weed plants yeah. that grew and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and that's all great. But at the same time, um, yes, I think we are in a great position to repopulate a certain species. But at the same time, I do not think the public is ready yet. There's a, still a lot more education that needs to be done. Mm. Um, if not, what's going to happen is we're going to have wild animals entering urban areas and more and more people calling for the removal of them and yeah. then th th that will be pointless yeah. so i think the stage that we we are at now we are really need to push for more education and, and really reach out to people on why people need to understand that it's no longer about you know even though it's urban areas it doesn't just belong to us it belongs to animals that have adapted to urban areas mm. we need to coexist with them and i mean i have i am my co uh, my colleague ambu have said this before so many times you know if you live in a place where there's nature around you cannot choose what you want to be with. Exactly. Mm. You cannot just choose butterflies and songbirds. You're going <laughs> to get the whole lot and you just the have nice to ones. coexist with them. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the class, that's why WWF uses a panda. It's, I want the cute animals. I don't want yeah. the, the ugly animals. But you, it's the whole ecosystem, isn't it? Yes. And on that point, there has been a number of stories recently because construction has resumed mm. with a passion right. post-COVID or post-lockdown, I should say. Pongal is just one example. There are others where there's been a number of interactions, isn't it, hasn't there, with long-tailed macaques going into the housing estates. You and I, and Glenn, we know why this is, because I live there. The construction is through the roof. Mm. So the greenery is going down. The long-tailed macaques are, are suddenly waking up and saying, where's my home gone? I need to find a new one. Then a construction site blossoms, and suddenly they've got free food around the dustbins and everything else. And so you must have seen, I'm sure, lots of reports, lots of phone calls about interactions, monkeys in the housing blocks. How do you, how, what do you say to the public when this keeps happening? Because it will keep happening as our construction grows. We get calls daily about macaques and otters also on how, you know, 
oh, these animals shouldn't be where we are living. They should be put in a sanctuary or in a fenced up area. You know, I live near Pongol as well. And, you know, if you just go back a decade, the landscape of Pongol yeah. was completely different. It was all forested area. Now, if you go there, the place is unrecognizable to Absolutely. me. So if it's unrecognizable to some of us, I mean, to the macaques, they have nowhere to go. To the north is the coastline. So they're going to come down south and they're going to venture into urban areas. So people need to understand that these animals simply have nowhere else to go. From Pongol, there is no other green areas to cross to. So there must be the level of tolerance and understanding that you know these animals are going to be urban areas and we need to know how to live with them. If you go down to Pongol, uh, I know which troop you're talking about, near the yeah. Pony Island and Correct. all that. If I you go the there, time. even today morning, you can see people throwing bread. I've seen cyclists go by, mm -hmm. throw down bread. And this feeding is creating a habit for them. They're going to be there for a long time. And yeah. the next time they see someone with food, they're going to snatch it. Yeah. And it's purely because of how we have trained them too. Yeah. So this all needs to be resolved through education and maybe a bit of enforcement as well. A lot of enforcement yeah. uh, that maybe is lacking now. So with that, then maybe we can get somewhere. Yeah. But but isn't you know it's depressing to me because you, you know Neil you've been here over twenty years I've been here nineteen years this has been discussed for many many years how to treat animals how to stay away from the animals how to not carry your bags full of food around the wild boars this is nothing new you know like when are we as a society gonna wake up and get it finally you know that the education seems to be there um, it's just people are not you know people still go up when they're I've seen this at Marina Bay, at Marina uh, at Gardens by the Bay East. You know, uh, the family of otters is there sunning themselves or having a snack by the by the side of the trail, and people will come up within a meter or less to take selfies with yes. with the otters, and then they wonder why the otters snap at them, or you know, because there's a young one there or something like that. When are people going to wake up? You guys have done your job. The AVA has done its job. The N Parks has done its job. What, when do when, when do we take individual? ownership of our responsibility? When will people take ownership? I think this will take a, a a long time. Like for artists, example, I think a lot of people still perceive them as really cute and adorable animals. They are cute. They're wild yeah, animals. So, yes, but they are wild sharp animals. Yeah, exactly. and, and at the same time, you know, in other countries, you know, uh, otters are kept as pets. So people might have seen their perception of otters may come from social media where they see people hugging and, right, and playing with otters. Right. So when they see otters, they be like, oh, that that's the so cute. I saw on the internet, you can go and touch it, you can go really near. Yeah. And some families are more, some uh, auto groups are more used to people than the others. Yeah, right. So they may not know. So they go near, I mean, we tell people all the time, they also don't listen to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, on the positive side, mm. the, you're doing just that. You're opening yeah. up the uh, the Acres Wildlife Rescue Center. You've got a major event next Saturday to celebrate your 29th month-long hiatus. Tell us about it, what's going to happen, and what you hope to achieve from it. So uh, on the 6th of August, we are having a supporters get together. Um, we have had a few before, but it's all online. But this time we are doing it physically. So when you come down, you'll get a tour. You'll get to see about the work that we do and the animals that we have. It's uh, an educational experience. On top of that, you will hear from us on what our plans are for the rest of the year. Uh, and of course, this event uh, is in hope to build up to our next big event, uh, which is happening on 8th of October, which is our gala dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, that is our usually our annual uh, fundraiser. It's yep. something we haven't been able to do for the past two years. So nice. we're finally doing it this year for our 21st uh, year of operating. So we are quite excited. Can anyone uh, sign up and go to that? So for the ITT, ticket? Yeah, to for the gala dinner. dinner. Yeah, I've been before. For the gala dinner, yes, you have to yes. buy a ticket. Um, all proceeds go to our uh, operations as well. And yeah. Yeah. And then uh, for the event next week, can anyone go? Yes, you just have to sign up. Yeah. yeah. And they do that on the website. On the website. We are also having a volunteering session uh, after the event where, you know, if you want to get your hands dirty, you can join us. We can do some gardening mm. uh, and some improvement works, maybe a bit of painting as well. Now, yeah. this is great. And I'll, I'll tell you why this is great, because I've been having this conversation a lot with my daughter yesterday, who's very pampered and very middle class. And it's very annoying because because. <laughs> You know, I grew up, I'm fortunate, yes, well, I say fortunate, I grew up on a housing estate, but I, a housing estate that had gardens. So from the earliest age, my, my hands were in the soil, I was weeding, I was gardening, I was cleaning up dog poop, I was doing all the usual things. Now, and I'm not criticizing any uh, organization, now you plant a tree. You know, you do that tree planting thing, right. and they give you gloves and the, the watering they the can. For and you. They practically, and some <laughs> poor migrant worker has pre-dug the hole, and and it's and it's great. And I've spoken to the guys about this, and they say because of insurance and health and yeah. safety, I get all of that. 
But my friend, my point is this, young people in particular, we need to get our hands in the soil, don't we? Literally and metaphorically, if we're going to appreciate nature, if we're going to respect this planet, we need our kids need to get their hands dirty once in a while. Yes, definitely. I mean, um, we at Acres, we work with volunteers, young and old, all the time. Uh, and I see it all the time. I think a lot of youngsters now, um, they think they can read something and be experts in it. But until you get your hands dirty, yeah, you haven't experienced it. So, yes, people need to get their hands dirty yeah. and be phys more physical with their hands. Can If people go to Acres, um, to your center, can they also work with the animals at all? Uh, yeah, so you can, but that is a separate thing. You need to sign up because we are we do have wild animals uh, that needs to be handled in a specific way. Yeah. Uh, they're not like dogs and cats. They're not going to wag their tail at you to let you know they're happy right. and all that. So uh, we just need that. There needs, there needs to be a bit of training and guidance with that. Right. So for that, for our rescue training, gotta be twenty one and above. You gotta come for a training because you're handling wild animals in public and you have to deal with people. <laughs> uh, That's harder than the wild animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then to help out at our rescue center with cleaning and feeding our animals, you just have to sign up separately and come down. Maybe we'll guide you along. And just briefly, you are looking for volunteers and staff at the moment, right? Yes, we are looking for volunteers all the time. We are looking for staff as well. Uh, we have a few new positions open. Uh, we have a brand new initiative that is our rapid response rider. It's a new bike thing that we are going oh, trying wow. to launch uh, nice. to go and rescue animals. Yeah. Uh, but we are looking for someone who can ride a bike and at the same time be passionate about helping animals. Wow. Uh, cool. We are also looking for a crime executive to help us with our investigations. A uh, crime executive. I like the sound of that one. <laughs> uh, also an uh, education executive to really you know, reach out to our masses to educate about them, which is our core uh, work and also someone to help us with social media and design. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Well, there's lots of opportunity for you to yes. work inside or outside, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, so the event is next Saturday, starts at 10 a.m. at the Acres Wildlife Rescue Center. You just go online. The registration link is on our Facebook page, and you can register to go. Kala, I want to give you the last word. What is your, what is your main message to people when it comes to how we are all having to interact with the natural world around us in Singapore? Um, I really think it's about coexisting and, and learning to be tolerant. Um, nobody's saying that, oh, if you have a three-meter python in your house, just let it be. Uh, obviously, the snake has to be relocated. But in most cases, you know, if you're talking about animals like macaques, otters, or other animals that are out in public, um, it's very important that people need to learn what to do and what not to do. Um, I'm not going to say it out. People need to go out and really go and find out for themselves. Uh, definitely things like no feeding and all that, but people need to be more patient with these animals. Yeah. Um, it's not an overnight thing. If you have macaques, you know, going to a certain area, it can't be resolved overnight. It takes a long time and people need to be more tolerant. And if you need more information, you go to acres.com.sg and have a look at all the events and all the resources. Get over there uh, next weekend for the event. Uh, donate. And in the meantime, uh, pleasure to have you with us. Kalai Vanan Balakrishnan, the CEO of Acres. Come back and see us again. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on a Saturday morning. Pleasure. Thank you. Saturday morning, only on Money FM 89.3.